Now, we're studying the book of Colossians and looking in particular at the theme, Complete in Christ. We've seen in the beginning of chapter 1, the first half of chapter 1, how Paul gave thanks for the spiritual growth in the Christians at Colossae, at this new church at Colossae. But he also encouraged them, we noticed two weeks ago, he also encouraged them that he's praying for them, that he wants them to grow even more. Paul wasn't happy that they just remained where they were. He wanted them to go on, to keep growing in their faith in Christ. And last week we saw how Paul presented to them in verses 15 down to 20 in particular. Paul presented to this church at Colossae the magnificence, the glory, the greatness of who Jesus is. He makes sure that they are established in this great truth of the supremacy of Christ. The word that he uses in, uh, in, in, and that we have translated here is that Jesus is the preeminent one. He is the most important one. But also, as we looked in the rest of that section from verse 21 down to 23, that there is sufficiency in the work of Jesus. The work that Jesus completed is sufficient for us today, 2,000 years later, just as it was for the church at Colossae when Paul was writing. Today, before Paul begins to address this false teaching that had come up amongst them, He reminds them and he writes to them of the great mystery of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We'll come back to that uh, that verse a little bit later on. But let's read from God's word. We're going to read from chapter 1 and verse 24. And we're going to read right down to chapter 2 and verse 5. This is what God's word says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, and now revealed to his saints. To them... God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And continuing into chapter 2, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for these writings of Paul. But we don't just thank you for Paul and for him writing them. We thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit prompted Paul to write these words, words which have stood the test of time because they are the very words of God, recorded for us, preserved for us, to speak to us and teach us today. So we pray, would you help us, Holy Spirit? Would you speak through these words into our lives to encourage us and to build us up in our faith in Christ Jesus? We ask this in his name. Amen. Now, in this section that we're looking at, um, effectively, Paul is still only on his introduction to the letter. He hasn't got yet to the meat of of what he wants to speak to them about and what he needs to address. And so in this section that we've begun from, from verse 24 of chapter 1, he's speaking of his credentials. Remember, Paul had not visited this church at Colossae. Epaphras heard the gospel message from Paul, no doubt when he was at, uh, when he was at Ephesus. 
And then he later took this message of hope to the, to the people of Colossae. The result of which was that a church was planted. Paul was now writing to them to correct some of the false teaching that had come in. The wrong teaching that had been established. But before he jumps into that, he establishes the fact that he is an apostle of God. An apostle of Jesus Christ. He establishes that right at the beginning. But also, he speaks of how, how, about how he has suffered for the sake of the gospel. Now, he doesn't go into the detail here in this section in Colossians 1 of how he suffered. But we get that from, from what he writes to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 lists a long list of all the different ways that Paul has suffered for the sake of the gospel. Three times he was beaten with rods. Five times the Jews gave him 39 lashes. You know, there's an interesting fact behind that. The normal punishment was 40 lashes. But in order to show grace and mercy, the Jews said, we'll only give you 39 instead of 40. It's a kind of perverse approach to, to grace and, and justice, isn't it? But Paul had experienced that five times. He had been whipped 39 times. Paul had been stoned. People had thrown stones at him to kill him. He'd been ship shipwrecked. Numerous other beatings. He had suffered so much for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of sharing this wonderful gospel message. And here in verse 24, where we started reading, not only does he, does he mention the sufferings and the way that he has suffered as an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the gospel, but he rejoices in that suffering. He says, I'm glad to have suffered for the name of Jesus. You hear accounts of, of persons who have been severely persecuted. I remember accounts of people in Eastern Europe under the communist regime at that time who were persecuted because of their faith in Christ and yet they counted it a joy that they could be they are deemed worthy to, to suffer for the name of Jesus. I wonder, how would you fare? How would I fare in those circumstances, in those situations? But Paul said he rejoiced that he had suffered, that he had suffered for the wider church, but also specifically for the people at Colossae, the church at Colossae. He goes on to speak in, 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 uh, in the next section of him, of him being a minister of the church or a servant of the church. He talks in verse 25 about his calling from God. This isn't just something that he took on one time. This was something that God placed on him, a calling, a ministry that God placed on him. And so he recognizes that, that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ, not just someone trying to, to beat his own drum and, and, and draw up support. That was the basis that he was writing to the church at Colossae. Not just because he loved controversy and wanted to wave in with his own opinions, would give his pennies worth as it were, but because God had called him and equipped him to make the word of God more fully known amongst the church there at Colossae. What was the word of God that he was referring to? Well, in practice, in physical practice, it would have been the, what we refer to as the Old Testament in our Bible. But actually, he defines it in a little bit more detail. He speaks of the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. We'll come back to this mystery a little bit later on. But in verse 28, Paul goes on to explain that his occupation had been to proclaim Christ to speak about Christ, to speak about his glory, to speak of his fame, to tell people of all that he had done. And his reason for doing this, so that his hearers might mature in Christ. Sound familiar? Think back two weeks when we were looking at the first section. Paul's desire, Paul's prayer was that they should know more, that they should continue to grow, that they should mature in Christ Jesus, in their faith in Christ Jesus. And he says in verse 29 that he's prepared to work hard to this end. He goes on in chapter 2 that where we've read to share about how much he has struggled for the church at Colossae and also for their near neighbours at Laodicea. 
Remember I mentioned two weeks ago in, in, in the beginning, um, the first session that, uh, that we preached from this, that Laodicea and Colossae were quite close geographically. They were near neighbors. And in fact, later on in the, at the, towards the end of the letter, Paul says, make sure this letter's read at Laodicea and you also read the one that I've sent to them. So there's a lot of close interchange with those two churches at Colossae and Laodicea. And he says, I've struggled for you. Here in verse 1 is the clue for us, verse 1 of chapter 2, confirming that Paul had not yet been to this church. He had not yet visited them. I want you to know, verse 1, how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me yet face to face. So that confirms for us that Paul hadn't been there. He hadn't visited them, but yet he loved them and he wanted them to grow more and more. And then he lists in verses, uh, verse 2 and onwards, he lists the purpose of his struggles for them so that their hearts might be encouraged. So the struggles he has for them and the reason for writing this letter is he wanted their hearts to be encouraged. He wanted them to be knit together in love. Also that they might reach all the riches of full assurance of the understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Now, you know, we could have a sermon or even a series of sermons just on that last, um, that last expression there. But then Paul breaks out in praise. You know, he just can't help himself. I, I did notice, I, I won't give you their names, but I did notice here in the church where we're not, not supposed to be singing, that there were, there were some who just couldn't help themselves but break out and sing during those songs. They're so worshipful, aren't they? As we lift up the name of Jesus, as we lift our praise, you just can't help but sing out, can you? As I say, I, I shan't share their names. That's between them and me and the Lord. But Paul breaks out in praise here. As he's speaking to them and as he tells them what he wants for them and and how he wants them to be encouraged and knit together. And he wants them to know the the riches of full assurance of understanding and and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. He breaks out in praise. To him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone that we may present everyone mature in Christ and so on. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory. Clearly, there were those coming in who who were trying to to disrupt the church, who were trying to bring in a, a false teaching, different doctrine. I've referred to it already over the last couple of weeks. Verse 4 refers to it specifically. His his desire, his concern was that no one delude the church. No one pull them aside or or pull them astray with plausible arguments. So clearly there were those coming in who were trying this work. Bringing in man's thinking or human thinking into the the great things of God. You You can never mix those two things. You cannot bring man's thinking or human thinking into God's things. Remember what God says in the Old Testament. He says, my thoughts are above your thoughts. My ways are beyond your ways. So let us never try and bring man's thinking or man's intellect into into the great and wonderful things of God. And Paul effectively says to them, he says, it pains me that I'm not with you to help you face to face with these things and to address these issues. But, he says in verse 5, I do rejoice again. I rejoice to hear of how well you're getting on in your faith in Christ. Just don't let anyone delude you. Don't let anyone draw you aside from the magnificence of who he is. And all of this, almost, by way of introduction. Not my introduction, don't worry, I'm not going to go on much longer. But all all this by way of introduction to the letter, before he even gets into addressing the specific concerns that he had and and the doctrine and the teaching that they needed. We'll have a look at that. We'll start having a look at that from next week. But I said I'd come back to verse 27 and referred to it already. Where Paul defines this mystery. He describes it as Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, many of us, especially those of us who have been brought up in church circles, will have heard that phrase time and time again. Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
And maybe to, maybe to such an extent that, you, that, you can, that it can roll off your tongue and you can, you can say it without even thinking and you hadn't any idea whereabouts it was in the Bible, but you knew it was a Bible verse. Well, here it is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. But what does that mean? And what is, what is he referring to? Well, it's that, great, it's that great story of the fact that when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, he comes and takes up his residence in us. The way we know that, the way we experience that, is through the indwelling of his wonderful Holy Spirit that Zoe referred to on the, on the video that, she, um, that we shared a little bit earlier. Now, you have to remember the, the, the context of, of what was happening here. And, and the commentators believe that, that, um, that the, the, the error that was coming in is that people were trying to, to take the, the new Christian church back to Judaism and trying to insist on some of the, the, Jude, the, 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 the Jewish laws and principles. And the, so the, the, the wonderful thing about what Paul is sharing with them of this mystery that has been revealed, that has been kept hidden for these ages and generations, but now has been revealed, is the mystery of the gospel, is the mystery of the fact that you and I can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery of the fact that Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. Not just because he was, he was seen to be um, a, a rebel, but he died on the cross as part of God's predetermined will. As part, of the, as part of the sacrifice that was to be made on your behalf and on my behalf. Because of the things that we have done wrong. Because we have disobeyed God's law. We have not lived our lives the way that he, he um, ordained and decided that we should live them. And we've gone against him and rebelled from God. But yet Jesus and, 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 and those things that we refer to, we sometimes call them sin. They're wrongdoings. They're things that go against what God has established in his word. But Jesus came and died on that cross and suffered all the pain and the agony for all the things that I have done wrong. This is this great mystery that Paul is, is writing to the, to the church at Colossae about. That God, who had revealed himself previously through his people, the children of Israel, now was revealing himself to all. He was going to the nations, to the Gentiles. And so this, this, this young church who were receiving this teaching of maybe being instructed that you need to go back to some of these Jewish laws and you need to remember that Jesus is a Jew. Absolutely, I agree with that 100%. And the laws are so instructive for us today as to the principles that God establishes. But we no longer need to keep the law because Christ died in our place. And this is the wonder of this mystery, that we, the Gentiles, who, who were not God's people, have been brought in to be God's people because Jesus died on that cross, because his precious blood was shed in order to wash me clean. And so, through the person of Jesus Christ, through the work of Jesus Christ, through the coming of this promised Messiah, the people at Colossae might know this great truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory. God chose to make this mystery known through the work of Jesus on the cross. As I've said, it was hidden in previous generations. In previous ages, it was hidden. Yes, you get glimpses throughout the Old Testament, but largely it was hidden. Remember what God said to Abraham? He said, through you, through this family, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And there are glimpses right the way through, little pictures, little vignettes, if you might say, little pictures of, of what God would yet do through Jesus Christ. Again, look at Abraham and the story of him taking his son, Isaac, the, the son that God had promised, and taking him up to that mountain, Mount Moriah. God had said, you're going to sacrifice your son. And he, he bound his son. He put him on the altar. He create, made an altar. He bound him and the, the wood was there. And he stretched out his hand. And God said, stop. Now I know that you will obey me. Now I know that you trust me and that you, that you will walk with me. 
But a beautiful picture there that I think it was 2,000 years after that event, another father would sacrifice his son at the same place, Mount Moriah, in what we now call Jerusalem, where the father, the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ sacrificed his only son. But there was no ram caught in the thicket there. And so we get these, these little pictures right the way through the Old Testament, which show us what God was going to do, which show us this mystery, so largely hidden from view. But we have the advantage of looking back and seeing that. And we can see what God was doing and giving these little glimpses. Think of the prophecies, the, the, the wonderful prophecies that have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ couple from Isaiah that, that we know that, that, that are so um, familiar to us. Unto us a child is born. And it goes on to say, the government shall be upon his shoulder. He'll be called the Prince of Peace. That was, that was the Father God giving us a, a little insight as to what would yet come, as to the mystery that would later be revealed when Jesus came. Isaiah 53, of course, the Lord placed all my iniquities on Jesus. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. Beautiful pictures of the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. So the mystery was there. It was hidden from full view, you might say, to be revealed at a later time, to be revealed when Jesus came. And completed that work on the cross. There are, there are dozens and dozens of other examples. Of pictures that we could give you from the Old Testament. Of what God was going to do. So many glimpses. But when Jesus came. The fullness of all that God would do. He did through him. And it was revealed through him. Paul said that God chose to reveal this mystery to the world. He chose to reveal this mystery to the church at Colossae. He's chosen to reveal this mystery to the church in Camborne, in Cornwall. The magnificence of Jesus that we've already read of last week in chapter 1. The preeminence of Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus. The greatness of who he is and what he has done. God has revealed it to us. But not only that, he is our hope that one day we will see him face to face in all his glory and majesty we have that hope of forever being with Jesus we have the hope of the father's house or the father's mansion as one translation puts it from Jesus words in John's gospel which he has prepared for us now, how do we put this into practice in our lives, this, this expression, the hope of glory? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, when we consider, remember, this is just one letter that when it was received by the church would have been read right through to the whole congregation. Not just taking half a dozen verses or so week by week and taking three months to get through it. No, the whole letter would have been read. So this expression, Christ in you, the hope of glory, follows the greatness of Paul's presentation of who Jesus is. The preeminence and the supremacy of Christ. That's enough to lift you from the gloom of winter, isn't it? The prospect of a, even the prospect of a winter of, of maybe semi or even full lockdown again. Our hearts can be lifted our, we, because we have a hope that is in Christ. And not only that, that hope is in us because Christ is in us. We have this mystery revealed to us today here in Camborne in Cornwall that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. And if you've trusted in him as your saviour and Lord, if you know that when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he did it for you personally. If you know that, then Christ is in you. He lives in you. The Holy Spirit has taken up his residence in you. And, and Zoe shared what she did um, a little bit earlier on that, on that wonderful film she produced. And the fullness of this life that we now have is because the Spirit of God is dwelling in us. We have Christ in us. The hope of glory. You know, maybe I need to tell myself this more often. 
but there's no need to be miserable. I do get a bit teasy occasionally, or maybe more than occasionally. The family will tell you. But we have this great hope, Christ in us, the wonderful saviour of the world, the one by whom the worlds were made, is in us, living in us. What a hope we have to live in this life. You go to the beginning of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's chapter 1, um, and it speaks there of, the, of the, the, the same power with which God raised Christ from among the dead is in us and towards us today. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That same power that God has uh, that, that, and that Zoe has referred to a little bit earlier. It's in us and working in us and working through us today. And it's not to attract attention to ourselves. I hope that when the, when the, the, the people see the joy in my face when I speak about Jesus. I hope people see that there is something, there's a, there's a different motivator in your life than money or things or possessions or television programs or whatever it is that occupies your, your time. I trust that people see in you that there is something different. And it's not to mark you out as this wonderful person. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what is shining out. And that's what we want to see shining out more and more as we engage with our community. That they see Christ in us. That they don't see Tim Bobman as this wonderful person or Jenny Allwright as this wonderful person or whoever it may be. But they see Christ in Jenny. That they see Christ in Lorraine. That they see Christ in Roger and so on. And that his life is being worked out in us for his glory, not for our own. <clears throat> the hope of glory. This glory that we look for. The glory of the presence of God. The glory of an eternity with him is real today. So if you're following Jesus, you're in eternity already. You don't have to wait until you die to get into eternity. If you're following Jesus, if you're his disciple, if you have Christ in you, you're in eternity already. You're living that eternal life. So as I said earlier, and I take this as a word to myself, please understand that. There's no need to be miserable. There's no need to be downcast. Why? Because we have Christ in us. The hope of glory. You know, this is not just something to aspire to. It's not something for you to say, oh, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could have what he's got. I wish I could make myself better so that I'd demonstrate this more. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. This is the truth of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Those who know that their sins have been completely forgiven. Those who are following Jesus day by day. The reality is, Christ is in you. The hope of glory. And that will be seen without you trying to make it be seen. If you're walking with Jesus, if you're reading your daily bread as, as Simon clearly did this morning, or whatever it is that you're following, or your, your Bible scripture passage that you're reading every morning, if you're reading that and spending time in the Word and spending time with the Holy Spirit and, and in the presence of Jesus, then Christ in you will be seen by everyone in this community, whether in this church community or wider beyond these walls. And that's what we long to be seen. Christ in us. The hope of glory. A hope that is outside of ourselves. A hope that is beyond ourselves. A hope that looks to eternity. But is experienced in the here and now. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the greatness and the magnificence of who he is. We thank you for all that he has done. We thank you for everyone listening to this today who can say that Jesus died in my place. Thank you for everyone who is following you, Lord Jesus. And I pray in our lives, may we see more and more the truth 
and the reality of this teaching, this doctrine, that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. May it point to that hope of seeing you one day face to face, Jesus. Oh, may it be soon, we pray. When all the trouble of this world will be gone, will be over. When all the aches and pains will be gone. And we shall see you, Lord Jesus, in all your beauty and your magnificence. We long for that day. May it be soon, Lord, we pray. But in the meantime, in the days that are left to us here, may we know more of you living in us and through us. To draw more to know you as their Lord and Saviour. We ask this for your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen.